You are, uh, yeah. Thank you. Please okay, is that all good? You can hear me? And you can see my slides? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Okay, yeah, thanks for um, having me to present and putting my talk also at a reasonable time here in the US. Um, I'm a scientist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in the US. Um, and today I'm gonna present about um, surface wave attenuation in seasonal sea ice, which we've observed with high resolution um, seafloor telecommunication cables. So this is gonna provide some of the first results um, applying this really exciting new method for what measuring waves in sea ice. Um, particularly in coastal zones. Um, but I, I do think that this method could be a really critical piece for understanding mechanisms of wave attenuation with observations. So I'm excited to, to share it and uh, hopefully get your feedback. Um, so just to orient to where we're, where we're talking about, where we're looking in this talk, um, this is worldview or visible satellite imagery of Alaska North Slope. So it's showing the seasonal evolution during the sunlight seasoning, seasons. Um, and what I want to point out here is the evolution of the land fast ice um, along the coastline. So um, a lot of the wave ice interactions that we're hearing about are focusing on the you know, attenuation within the pack ice. Um, we also see attenuation within this land fast ice, but it, for much of the year it's um, fixed and um, more persistent. Um, and it forms and breaks at, at different times compared to the pack ice. Um, this coastal ice is really important, particularly in these coastal systems, and the seasonal break with the ice is driven by a combination of um, thermal and mechanical processes, especially including surface waves. Um, when ice has broken up, um, wave activity can contribute to coastal erosion processes, and so this is um, provides some strong motivation for studying wave ice interactions in this type of ice in particular. Um, so following spring breakup until fall formation, there's more likely to be wave activity at the coastline and waves can contribute to coastal erosion processes, um, includes, including thaw slump, which that's uh, shown in the schematic and then also in this um, photo um, where we can see these really dramatic um, thaw events along the coastline. I think everyone in this meeting probably already knows pretty well that the wave climate in the Arctic is, is growing, um, getting bigger and with waves covering the Arctic for more of the year. Waves that are forming offshore in this larger fetch between the pack ice and the land um, become the forcing for, for land fast ice um, so they can propagate towards the coastline and are attenuated by the land fast ice when it's present. Um, so this example shows really nicely um, some attenuation in, in land fast ice that was forming in the fall, um, which you can see in this sentinel image on the left, um, this ice along the coastline. Um, and then the plot on the right shows the gradual attenuation of that um, offshore wave um, as it moves towards um, towards the shore. So it creates a gradient of wave heights from offshore through the ice. Um, and so, yeah, as we've motivated this with, we, we see that the you know persistence of this ice continues to attenuate waves um, and provides this um, protection and limiting wave exposure um, throughout a lot of the year. So this is another plot showing um, a time series looking at that where um, it's comparing, this is comparing two moorings, one within the land fast ice zone and one outside. And so in the time series, you can see that that, that one outside of the land fast ice sees waves much earlier. Um, so that's the gray and compared to the one in the ice and the teal. And even once you start to see waves in the teal are attenuated compared to the one offshore. Um, and so on the bottom, that cumulative wave exposure is um, really reduced to the coastline. Um, however, we still need to connect the dots between this, these, the increase in waves in the Arctic Basin in general um, that we've talked about and the changes in coastal land fast ice. Um, and our understanding of the processes by which waves break up the coastal ice and contribute to coastal Arctic coastal erosion are still largely limited by diversity of observations to understand these processes. Um, so I think that one of the things that has slowed progress in understanding waves in sea ice is our ability to observe waves with a resolution that allows us to separate and understand the processes contributing to attenuation. So we see a lot of diversity in how we model these different processes because um, it can be hard to actually measure those things that are contributing to that attenuation. Um, so for example, the two types of observations that we often see, um, so the, on the left is um, an example of observations from buoys. Um, so comparing attenuation rates at distances from the edge. Um, 
So we could deploy buoys in these large arrays, like like in the results that Will was just showing as well. Um, so we can capture attenuation over these types of events. But um, you know, they, at the end of the event, they drift away and they don't they no longer kind of cover this gradient in the way that we want them to. So they can resolve spatial gradients but lack persistence. On the other hand, um, we can put out moorings, which um, can be really persistent throughout the year and getting these really nice time series, but um, because they're so onerous to deploy and recover, we typically don't get very many. So in this example, similar to the one that I showed, I think on the last slide, um, you know, we just have two observations that show the attenuation within the landfast ice um, over the whole season. So we have that persistence, but we're really lacking spatial resolution to understand what's actually happening between those two points in space. So um, a new possible method to close this gap um, is using seafloor telecommunication cables with distributed acoustic sensing or DAS. Um, and so this has the potential for both temporal persistence and spatial resolution. Um, so yeah, I think that this could be really potentially transformative for the way that we observe waves and other processes in coastal systems, especially um, in, these, in these remote regions and with really high spatial variability, like when there's sea ice on the surface. Um, and one of the other big benefits is that this takes it can take advantage of existing infrastructures. So we're using telecommunication cables that it can be already laid um, and just attaching an instrument on the on the land side. So um, there's that's another benefit here. So in the schematic, we can see um, this telecommunication cable is usually buried in the seafloor um, beneath the ocean with waves on the surface. So we do have to use this in relatively shallow, shallow areas. Um, the distributed acoustic sensing inter interrogators are attached to land side and send a laser pulse through the fiber optic cable, cable which is scattered um, by the fiber. And that backscattered light is measured um, by the interrogator to provide a measurement of strain or strain rate. Um, that strain shows the response to acoustic waveforms, um, pressure perturbations from surface waves. Um, so there's a lot of different types of signals we can measure with it, I'm obviously. Focusing on today's surface waves, and that's the thing I'm most interested in, but it's useful for a lot of different um, types of geophysical phenomena, as you can imagine. And just as some examples of um, numbers for what I mean by temporal persistence and spatial resolution, I mean, so we can measure it continuously. It's on the coastline. Um, we're mostly limited by the, the data volume, um, and it can measure continuously up to at one kilohertz. Um, spatially, we can get really high resolution um, with channel spacings um, down to one to one to two meters common. For, for surface waves, you don't even necessarily need that high resolution, um, but we can get really high, uh, high resolution that basically allows us to act like we have um, thousands of seafloor moorings along um, kilometers of cable. Okay, so this is an example. So this this method is being developed, um, you know, for the Arctic, which I'm going to show, but also um, a lot for coastal oceans, where we can also have spatial variability, and there it can be a little bit easier to um, develop methods and validate. So here's these are just some examples um, showing comparisons of wave parameters derived from DAS um, with more traditional ways of measuring waves. So on the left, this is from Duck, North Carolina, um, and in the surf zone. And so the black is from an AWAC, um, and then the red is, is the wave parameters derived from the DAS, and you can see that it captures that really well. And um, the scatter plots on the right show really high correlation between those two. Um, this is results from um, a, a colleague, Hannah Glover. Um, the right plot on the bottom is from another experiment that I um, collected data for off, off the shore here in Cape Cod, um, where we yeah, similarly used a seafloor cable. And we, again, see really high correlations of the wave height um, here from a wave LIDAR with the, that from measured from DAS. So um, these observations in, in coastal oceans are also showing that our kind of also providing a good baseline to trust that this can retrieve wave parameters well with empirical calibration. The experiment I want to focus on today um, is this, this data that we have using um, these same types of measurements to observe waves along a telecommunication cable in the Alaskan Arctic. Um, this is in collaboration with Michael Baker and Rob Abbott at San Diego National Labs, who are leading the effort to collect this DAS data to explore possible applications. Um, and essentially, we're here they're sensing the strain of the cable um, at approximately 10 meter resolution all along this, this cable um, to 40 kilometers offshore going out from uh, Prudhoe Bay in the north slope of Alaska. Um, so just to be really clear, these are existing cables that were installed by um, on the seafloor by a company called Quintilian. Um, so they installed cables at all the locations in the map 
Um, for now, we're focusing on this, this cable um, at elliptic point near Prudhoe Bay. Um, this is currently the only one with a dark fiber so that we can actually use this technology on, but we do hope to find ways to use some of the others in the future as well. Um, so one of the other things, one of the other potential applications, this as well outside of um, wave observations, but that could also, again, be useful for this, this type of analysis is um, that it may be um, possible to quantify also the ice thickness with these measurements from this cable. Um, so this is work from our colleagues at Sandia, um, where they've um, based, yeah, used data from the cable in winter um, with some assumptions of the properties of the sea ice to invert for ice and snow thickness. Um, and so, yeah, this shows a profile at one point in time. Um, I think the right is a little easier to interpret where they're showing this, um, the, the ice thickness in yellow with some standard deviation and then the snow in red. Um, so yeah, there's some assumptions going into here and, and unfortunately we didn't have data to validate, but this shows um, good promise, I think, for getting thickness as well from this data um, at different times of year as well. Um, but we're gonna turn to thinking about after this ice breaks out and there's much more open water in the summer and fall when waves are present. Um, and so here we're gonna start by talking about the period when there's open water for validation. Um, so we, to do this, we deployed a buoy in 2022 that coincided um, with the DAS collection right on top of the cable. Um, in the future, we hope to improve on these calibrations using um, a more extensive set of data that we collected this year where we had more moorings out along the cable, but for one, we just uh, are using this data set where we had one mooring to calibrate the full length of the cable. Uh, but yeah, stay tuned hopefully for improved, new and improved methods and data sets in the future. Um, yeah, so these are first results from the open water calibration. So the <clears throat> this is looking at a time series of the DAS um, re retrieved wave parameters in purple um, compared to the observations from the wave buoy in orange. Um, yeah, so you can see that the the from this first empirical calibration, the DAS is capturing a lot of the um, kind of key changes in that in that time series um, over this about week long data collection. Um, and yeah, so the top here is the significant wave height does particularly well for that. The, the energy weighted period on the bottom um, still does pretty well. There's not a lot of dynamic range in this data set, unfortunately, but the the errors are, are pretty low. So we think this is doing um, pretty well. To quickly go through the method um, for how we drive this data, um, we are using an empirical calibration to convert the strain from the cable to, um, to something like pressure so that we can calculate spectra from it. And so this this um, calibration is is done in, in frequency space. So we basically create an empirical correction factor by um, calculating the ratio of the spectra of the strain at every point in time over that um, over the wave spectra from the buoy. And so that, those are all shown in purple here. And then the black is the meaning of those, which we use as the empirical correction going forward. So then we can take a strain measurement at any point in space and time and apply that channel specific correction factor to get a um, wave spectra. And so the, the initial one is shown in purple here with the dash line. Um, we do sometimes see high, some like extra energy in the high frequencies. So we apply an extra um, empirical cutoff uh, when we see these additional peaks and fit the canonical F to the minus fourth. So that gives us a pretty good looking wave spectra. Um, it compares well with the buoy spectra in orange. Um, and from that, we can calculate the bulk parameters as well. So during the open water season, waves are relatively spatially homogeneous. Um, so this is both, both useful for our methods of calibrating, but also means that DAS can provide high fidelity method for capturing near shore wave forcing and coastal wave exposure during open water period. Um, this is useful because due to lack of alternative data, hindcasts are often what are used to assess coastal exposure in this region. Um, but hindcasts lack necessary resolution to capture seasonal transitions. Um, and so uh, this type of method could provide persistent wave measurements to assess coastal wave exposure um, and risk. Okay, but what's a lot more interesting is thinking about what happens when there's sea ice on the surface. Um, so obviously that's what most of us here are really interested in, but also sea ice is providing a lot of spatial heterogeneity that is hard to capture. Um, with most methods and is where this type of method can really shine. 
Um, so this image is, uh, this is a SAR image from Sentinel-1 in November, 2021, uh, which was during one of our periods of DAFS observation. And um, so it shows here, the, the white here is showing where there's relatively uh, so smooth, smooth new ice, and then the darker patches are this uh, wind roughened open ocean. And so you can see there's this large patch of open water from around uh, 17 or 18 kilometers along cable to about 35 kilometers long cable distance. And then obviously the land is in the lower part of this image. So um, if we look at the, we can apply those correction factors from open water to our data set from this ice covered period and look at the wave parameters now over a slice in space rather than a slice, a slice in time. Um, so this is looking at um, one point in time, which is not exactly the same as when this image was taken, but it's um, just a few hours apart. And you can see that um, this kind of uh, transitions from open water, uh, mostly offshore, agrees with where we can see open water in the in the SAR image. Um, and then we see this transition of ice edge um, where the waves are attenuated um, going closer to the shore. Um, yeah, so the vertical line here is what we delineate um, using a attenuation cutoff as the ice edge, um, and that approximately match up, matches up with what's in the image. Um, yeah, so we similarly see expected changes in the energy weighted wave period. So with, with this instance of the ice, where we see with the attenuation of the wind waves, um, higher mean periods um, with distance into the ice. Um, so that's all pretty, that's all really cool to see in this high spatial resolution, but what's really cool is what we can do with using this high spatial resolution comparing between um, different locations. Um, so in particular, we can calculate attenuation. Um, and we do this, we can do this in a bulk sense, so we can also do this spectrally because we have calculated spectra. Um, so this example shows just pulling from these two uh, locations. Oh, I realized, I think I said that was the ice edge. It's not, these are lines indicating the locations of the two spectra that are on the left here. Um, and so using the attenuation equation, we can calculate an attenuation spectra um, over that distance. Um, I've shaded out the two ends where we don't really trust the, the spectra as well, but for this region, we this part of the spectra, we get a shape that we would expect where we have higher attenuations at higher frequencies. So, um, yeah, we can take advantage of this um, this resolution to calculate attenuation um, along the transect. Um, we can look at it in the bulk sense. So the, the wave height attenuation is shown here, but then also um, we picked out two attenuations of two frequencies. So point one is the X's and then the crosses are point two. So as we'd expect, we see that initially those um, attenuations, the higher frequencies are much higher. Um, interestingly, that actually switches as we get quite far um, into the ice, closer to the coast, where a lot of that high frequency energy has already been attenuated. Um, yeah, and we see some other kind of features in how this attenuation varies over space. Um, higher attenuation at some points likely associated with um, thicker ice or higher concentrations. Oh, yeah, and just to say that these really low, really low values that are really noisy um, are off offshore, mostly attenuated. Um, we assume are open water. So um, we create a, we've uh, determined a cutoff that we use as the ice edge. And so that the values have to be above that to be considered um, in the ice. Yeah, and so just reiterating what I've said, these, this really high resolution estimates of wave attenuation can um, be useful. They can provide better process understanding of what's um, driving when att wave attenuation. Um, so we have some ideas of how we might use this high resolution, um, especially taking advantage of like the yeah, the kind of spatiotemporal very uh, capturing both in space and time to look at um, that we might be able to capture some aspects of like wave reflection and maybe see whether um, how those, uh, yeah, to capture what process we think might be driving that. Um, and also hopefully in the future when we have validated the thickness method, um, we hope that we might be able to use this to also at the same time calculate sea ice thickness. Um, so that we would have these co-located data sets um, that might be useful for, um, uh, yeah, tuning or, or uh, calibrating models. Um, I think I'm running out of time, but I do also want to show that there's some really cool things we can do um, taking advantage of the, the both the spatial and temporal resolution. Um, so this plot on the left now is showing uh, the attenuation of wave height as a function both now of time and space. So the time over about a day 
is shown on the x-axis or just over a day and then distances on the y so the white line here delineates what we determined as the excuse ice me. edge um excuse me you have two more minutes okay yeah okay i'll be okay. done i have two more slides yeah. um yeah and so i think i just want to point out that there's some really cool features we can see here that indicate um the evolution over time of the ice. Um, so the first thing that jumps out is these peaks in high attenuation, which um, likely indicate thicker ice. Um, we also see changes in the location of the ice edge over time. So this, um, when it moves towards the shore, that indicates here, I think, compaction of the ice edge, but then also corresponds with this, this thicker ice that we're getting towards the shore. Um, and then later, towards the end of this time series, we see ice edge advance. Um, so we can quantify some of these um, aspects of this evolution. Um, and so building on some prior work from, from Jim, um, we can use, uh, we can calculate the radiation stress gradient using our observations. Um, and yeah, what we, so actually what I meant to say is that first we can calculate the change in this ice edge over time. So we have the velocity of that ice edge shift. One reason that we think that might happen is because of um, the radiation stress gradient, which can drive um, ice motion both along, but also in the cross shore direction. Um, and so this, the value that we calculate for that is very similar to that that we observe. Um, so this, this shoreward velocity, um, potentially in addition to the other, other aspects like the Stokes drift and direct wind, wind drift, um, those together are likely resulting in the compaction of the ice edge into this higher concentration and, and thicker ice. Oh, that's quite loud. I don't know if you can hear that. Hopefully I didn't share audio. <laughs> um, yeah, so just to conclude, um, I have this video showing, I think, really is nicely summarizing this really high spatial resolution or spatial variability over this area where I think this method really shines. Um, and I think these fiber optic cables can be a really cool way to measure wave attenuation um, across these scales in the Arctic, um, potentially also waves elsewhere. And these sig signals can then be used to help us understand aspects um, of both wave and ice evolution. And so two examples of that that I showed are this wave-driven advection via the radiation stress gradients, which we can estimate with this data. Um, we can also see that the wave attenuation is really spatially variable um, and is likely related to, to the ice conditions. So yeah, hopefully quantification of that, that will be um, useful for modeling applications as well. Oop. Yeah, so that's all I have. Um, in the future, I do plan to dig more into these seasonal transitions, the breakup and formation. Um, which will hopefully also be um, useful for improving prediction of changes in the ice itself. Um, yeah, happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any question? Yeah. Um, I could ask a very quick question, um, and then I see Alex has got a question, but um, fantastic um, work. The, the first question is, you've obviously the teeny tiny problem that you've got to have the cable there. So yeah. I presume this is a great spot. I can't imagine there's many other places that you'd have the cable with ice. Yeah, it's definitely limited. I mean, I think especially because they're deployed for internet and there aren't that many places with sea ice where there's like big communities that need um, internet. But there but there are other places. I mean, so there's this network of cable in the, in the last... Alaskan Arctic, and hopefully there's ways we can use the others. There's some in Svalbard, there's some in other parts of the Arctic. I think that this is likely not going to be a way that we can like monitor waves all across the Arctic, but hopefully having these opportunities where this is really good infrastructure already, we, we can use it to like understand the processes in those locations better. Um, we are also hopefully in the future, we have proposal to um, explore potential of um, deploying some of our own cable. Um, it is, there are a lot of challenges with that, but I think there's also potential for, um, yeah, I mean, rallying around certain areas that we want to observe um, these types of processes in to deploy cables dedicated for science that we could um, use to measure these these types of processes. How deep does it, I mean, realistically, you can't put it on the, the ocean, deep ocean floor, it'd be too deep, is that right? Yeah, well, so I mean, like with any pressure, seafloor pressure morning, I mean, we're limited, if we want to measure surface waves, we're limited to like, you know, the depth of attenuation, Depend, you know, obviously it's related to what the height of the waves that we're trying to measure is. I mean, in Alaskan Arctic, we're in this case quite fortunate that it's shallow for a long ways, so we can still measure the waves for quite a distance out. Um, yeah, so this wouldn't be good in like places where the shelf drops off quite rapidly. Yeah. But, 
anyways, it has, you know, places where it's really useful and places where it will not be a good method. But I think it's a great thing to add to our toolbox for those locations. No, no, it is. No, it's it's quite remarkable. Yeah. And the fact that you've got this very long time monitoring is amazing, but no real cost. Yeah. And it's fixed well, in space. It doesn't drift around and cost. Yeah. It's true. Um, yeah. The, the, there's, there are no that cost, cost comment. But it's definitely less than others. And especially, I mean, the data volume is actually kind of a, a challenge. But um, yeah. Should yeah. I answer the, the question in the chat too? Um, okay. Oh, yeah. I can just. Sounds like the distributed. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. You can read I it think then. You answered <laughs> it actually. So, like in Antarctica, where the shelf is like three to 500 meters deep, we can't do this. Is that right? Probably not. Yeah. So we wouldn't get surface waves, but I do think that there are likely other, anyways, there's other people working on like other ocean processes that you can likely observe. I mean, if it's, a, if it's really, you know, deep sea floor, I guess the one in Antarctica is going to be really quite deep. So I don't know what you would see there, but you know, on, on coastal shelves, you can also see things like internal waves and, hmm. um, you know, there there are potentially other things oceanographically that we might still observe with cables that are deeper than we might be useful for surface waves. But yeah, I think, I mean, this method is still really new for a lot of applications. So there's still a lot that we don't know about what we can do with it. But. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Yeah. Is there any other question? If not, thank you. Thank you, Madison, for your talk. You, yeah. Jay Thompson, are you here? I can't see your name in part. Next speaker, Jay Thompson, are you here? No. I know he's planning to present because he shared his slides, so <laughs> um, he might have just gotten the time wrong. I can send him a quick message. Yeah, I think you should find him up. Ready? Get more aggressive. Yeah. Are you in the same um, time zone or? He's three hours earlier, but. Um... Yeah, yeah. Right. 